Hello, poppers and popsicles. My name is TB Skyn, and there's been a substantial number of minor lore updates to League of Legends coming out in the aftermath of the release of Silas. Interestingly, though, none of them seem to be directly related to the new champion. Rather, they seem to be a little bits of maintenance being done on the universe to bring characters up to speed with the states that they need to be in for things going forward. I'm heartily in favor of that. Maintenance is always the hardest part of maintaining a fictional universe. It's easy enough to set it up, and it's easy enough to do all kinds of big plot twists and stuff, but just doing the maintenance, doing the regular work to keep it in tip-top shape, that's the hard part. And it's something that, <clears throat> as I've talked about many times before, Riot have not always been very good at. The stories we've got are for Ash, Trindamir, Sivir, Nar, and the Blood Moon skins, and... Uh, while Ash, Trindamir, and Nar are all Freljord champions, there doesn't seem to be any sort of unifying theme across the entirety of the set of lore updates that we're getting. So for the purposes of this video, we're going to be focusing on Ash and Trindamir, because I think that's where the most interesting stuff is going on. So, Ash is receiving a lore update, I suspect, primarily because of the comic series that Riot is currently doing with Marvel, Ash, War Mother. And I've got a video on the first issue of that comic elsewhere on my channel if you're interested in seeing that. The second issue of that comic is due to come out sometime this month. And the interesting thing about the update to Ash's bio is that it's stealing kind of a lot of thunder from the next issue of Ash War Mother because it seems to be recounting the entirety of what's going to be happening in the next three issues of the comic. Or, you know, perhaps they've got some massive twist planned for the comics and they're just running a smokescreen for it. But it seems like that's what they're doing. So if you don't want any potential spoilers for the next three issues of Ash War Mother, well, you can click on the timestamp down in the description or on screen right, go to the timestamp on screen right now, and you'll, you know, you'll be past the particular spoilers for Ash War Mother, and we'll be talking about the other interesting details in this particular lore update. But yeah, apparently they decided to spoil um, the entirety of their, you know, massively promoted comic collaboration with Marvel Comics on their website. And... Like, from a certain perspective, there is, you, you can see how it would make a certain degree of sense to do that. First of all, because the comic series is a collaboration with Marvel. It's supposed to be sold in, you know, in physical stores and stuff. It's supposed to be an outreach thing to bring new fans into being interested in the League of Legends universe, which means it's not aimed at the kind of nerds who would go online and read all the character details on the universe webpage. Hence, it's probably not going to spoil any of the people it's supposed to be reaching. And you can also kind of see that what they would want from the bio on their website would be to have the most up-to-date current state of her lore telling us how she came to be the character that we get to play in game today but it's still a little bit weird that they're recounting a bunch of stuff that's going to be happening in Ash War Mother before Ash War Mother has had a time to make a splash by its particular portrayal of those events it's it's it's, it's a strange decision i'm not sure why Riot did this but let's talk about what this bio update is actually spoiling. As we know from the first issue of Ash War Mother, Ash is now the daughter of a War Mother called Grena, who's a powerful leader of a tribe whose fortunes are rather fading. And they're fading in part because Ash's mother is obsessed with the throne of Avarosa, which is a magical secret hoard of magical items and treasures that she thinks will bring her tribe back on top. And she's been chasing that treasure for years and years, and that obsession has nearly killed her and has nearly ruined the entire tribe multiple times. As we see in Ash War Mother issue number one, by the end, by the cliffhanger ending of the that particular comic, well, it seems like Grena has finally led the Iceborne warriors of her tribe into total disaster, surrounded by enemies about to be charged down. And this is where the bio begins to spoil things a little bit for us, because it tells us that Grena was killed, which we could probably figure out, but and most of Ash's tribe is wiped out, which seems to be the kind of thing that should be happening in issue number two. And then it says that alone pursued, Ash followed her mother's last map to a deserted glacier where she found the supposed grave of Avarosa and her magical bow of true eyes. Ash used the weapon to avenge her mother's death, then turned west. This is all stuff we didn't know yet, and which seems to be a lot of what's supposed to create the dramatic tension um, for the next few issues of the comic. Whether it was out of duty or loneliness, Ash gained a reputation by protecting the many scattered hearthbound tribes she encountered. She spurned the custom of taking thralls, and instead chose to adopt these desperate people as full members of her new tribe, and her fame grew quickly. Soon, many began to believe that she did not just carry the weapon of Avarosa, as what Ash was the legend herself reborn and destined to re reunite the Freljord. But tall tales would not feed her followers, and their long march south left the tribe on the verge of starvation. So Ash leveraged the myths of surrounding her, uh, using them to form alliances with the powerful and land-rich southern tribes, promising to unite them into a nation capable of challenging na neighboring kingdoms. These new alliances brought new dangers, and Ash quickly found herself at the center of a political feud. 
And that brings us up, I think, more or less to, to present day. It then goes on to detail how she comes to marry Trindomir, but we'll be talking about that in a little bit. So essentially, the plot of Ash Warmother for the next three uh, uh, issues laid out in front of us right there, but it also introduces a couple of new interesting twists to Ash's character. Now, the Ash character that we knew was always kind of a one-note character. Like, you had, like, Sejuani, who's the violent Freljord leader, and you have Lysandra, who's, like, the scheming Freljord leader, and then you have Ash, who was, like, the good and idealistic Freljord leader. And that used to be the trio of personalities that dominated the politics of the Freljord, and that was quite kind of... None of them were particularly well-developed as characters, but they had this, you know, three-way dynamic of struggling for power and different visions for what the Freljord could be, yada, yada, yada. As a consequence, Ash was never really that much of a character to us up until now. She was more like, I am the future of the Freljord because I believe in peace and uniting the peoples into the thing and doing the good right thing because I have a vision and I'm idealistic and avarosa and stuff. Like, she was very much, she was the lady with the vision and that was about all that was to her. Now, the characterization that's coming from Ash Warmother, and the one that seems to be bleeding into the lore proper, is that Ash is not so much an idealist, she's not so much someone who has a grand political vision for the future of the Freljord, as she is someone who's like, well, I've seen what my mother kept doing, and raiding and stuff seems like a bad idea. I would prefer to protect people, and now I have this ultra-powerful magical bow that gives me a lot of power to protect people, so that's what I'm gonna be doing. But it's not 100% clear just how deeply she believes in the Avarosan vision of a united Freljord. How deeply she believes in all of that. It seems that she's kind of... She found these people who were desperate and in need, in need of protection. And then she said, okay, well, I'll adopt you and I'll protect you. And then it turns out when you have a bunch of people under your protection, more people come along and want to have your protection as well. And you also get a lot of enemies who want to destroy the people who you are protecting or steal things from them. And it seems like she's kind of on top of this escalating sort of avalanche of things happening sort of outside of her control. She doesn't pr proclaim herself the inheritor of Avarosa. People kind of do that for her and start talking about her as a reincarnation, which doesn't seem to be something Ash necessarily wanted. And that comes into play a little bit more in her short story, The Harder Path, where we get some meditations from Ash herself, where the weight of the bow is clearly weighing on her a little bit. She has a passage where she wonders if they follow her or if they follow the magical bow. Like, if that is the symbol that they're rallying around and whether they really care so much about, you know, making some nice tribes where people can be safe and not get murdered all the time. And there's also a stinger at the end of Ash's new bio that goes, Now Ash stands at the head of the largest coalition of Freljordian tribes in many generations. Even so, the unity she would bring rests on an uneasy peace. Threatened by internal intrigues, foreign powers, the growing violent horde of the Winter's Claw, that's your Sejuani, and a supposed destiny that Ash must at least pretend to believe. Combine that with Swain's voice line from his update where he says, um, she told them... Uh, she found the grave of Avarosa, or that it was Avarosa's bow. They believed her, which implies that Ash is lying about some crucial details relating to the bow that she's wielding in the name of Avarosa. So we're introducing a lot of ambiguity, and we're introducing a lot of character fallibility to the concept of Ash. And on the one hand, that's a really good thing. Like, I think that's a good thing that they are deepening her character, that they're giving her doubts and flaws and foibles and weaknesses, and that they're sort of making clear that Ash is not necessarily 100% in control of the mission that she has put herself on here. She's kind of going along with the flow, whether she wants to or not. And that's, that's more relatable on a human scale than sort of a perfect idealist who always knows exactly what they're doing. They have a clear vision of everything they want to do in their head. Because, like, with Ash, it's more like, well, I started doing this thing, and then a whole bunch of people came along and joined in with the thing, and now I have this huge following of people who want to see me do the thing, and I don't know what the hell is happening, so I'm just kind of going to have to go with the flow. How the hell did I get 45,000 subscribers on this goddamn channel? Why are you all here? Anyway, I got off an attention there a little bit. W what I'm trying to say is that this version of Ash is substantially more relatable as a human character. Now, the thing I worry about, though, is that with the loss of that particular vision of idealism, you also lose out on a little bit of the interesting dynamic between her, Lysandra, and Sejuani. And what I can only assume is that they're setting up for a deepening of the lore surrounding all three of the sisters, or rather, Lysandra and the two new leaders who are taking up the mantle of her now-dead sisters, who she betrayed, like, whatever. Essentially, it seems like what Riot is gearing up for is trying to create a vision of the Freljord where the characters are a lot more complex than the broad archetypes that they used to embody. And that's an admirable goal, to be sure, 
for me, it's just, I, I guess maybe I have some nostalgia here that the uncomplicated Ash, who like literally just is this perfect visionary, charging straight ahead with his grand vision of, of the good place that the Freljord could be if we all just work together. If she goes away too much, I'll be a little sad because I kind of, I kind of have a thing for that kind of storytelling where someone like who is, who has a vision and a certainty in their moral courage and who will fight for that with every fiber of the being, rather than someone who's afflicted with ambiguity and conflict in human emotions. But that's, I guess, that's not really a flaw in Ash's lore. That's just a, a matter of my personal preference that if that part of it goes away, I'll be a little bit sad. Speaking of Sejuani, she also has a little bit of a cameo in Ash's new bio. As it says, uh, when Ash is like feeling alone, isolated, and burdened because she's Grena's daughter and the tribe isn't doing so hot, her only respite was when Sejuani, an ice-born girl from a sister tribe, would stay with them for the summer hunts around the Ordenkal Rocks. The girls' friendship defined their childhoods but was cut short just as they reached their teens. Somehow Grena had offended Sejuani's grandmother and the fellowship between their tribes ended suddenly. Oh, hello there! New and interesting character detail that has never been introduced to the lore before. As far as I remember, Ash and Shatwani didn't really have a relationship before, of any kind, except that, you know, they're rival leaders and they want different things from the Freljord, and, and Ash is the peacemaker and Shatwani is the violent one, and that was about it for their dynamic. Now we're being introduced to the twist that they are actually childhood friends who were set on different paths by fate that carried them in different directions and now they have totally different experiences and totally different reasons for why they want the Freljord to be organized in the way that they do where Ash has this grand vision of she wants to correct her mother's mistakes and make peace and instead of going raiding all the time we could all co co collaborate and cooperate and we'll plant food instead of raiding it from other tribes all the time and that'll be much better. And what I can only imagine is that this is the first hints of a setup from where they're going to be deepening the character of Sejuani as well. They're going to give us a more complicated backstory for her that explains why she is so violent, why she is so set in the warlike tribal raiding ways of the Freljord, why she's so intent on the violence, why she believes that it is necessary for the Freljord. And that's supposed to set up, because what's being set up here is, oh, they were childhood friends, they drifted apart, isn't it tragic that now they have to fight as adults over different idealistic visions of what the Freljord should be? But that only works if they then, if, like, if there is a substantial exploration of each of their moral characters and dimensions that can then be contrasted with each other, and if they, through their clashes with each other, learn something and grow as people. And now I'm looking very, very far ahead indeed, but... Like, the reason why you would do that, the reason why you would introduce that character mechanic is to have a moment when, after years of bitter conflict and falling out as friends and sort of remembering, oh, wasn't it much better back in the day and stuff, eventually they'll come to the point where they have to unite against a common enemy of some kind. Which is possibly Lysandra, who uh, we know is either plotting to unleash the Void onto the Freljord and, and the whole world, or is trying to delay the Void from being unleashed as long as possible, at which point she will then sacrifice everything to the Void in order to live longer herself. We don't really exactly know what Sejuani, uh, what uh, Lysandra's motivations are, but it could be that Sejuani and Ash will either be fighting together against Lysandra eventually, once they realize that they're being manipulated by this evil, immortal Ice Witch who has been screwing with the Freljord since the beginning, or they will be uniting to fight the Void, and that's when you'll get that moment where both of their different character paths will, you know, coalesce into a synthesis, and they'll both gain some character growth and a new character dynamic, and it's, ah, oh, gonna be good. But that's, that's like very, very far out in the future, I would imagine. That would be a major lore event, and the chances of Riot doing that within the next few years are, I would have to say, slim to none. Anyway, let's return to Asher's short story. The short story is really just kind of a world-building exercise. Like I said, the lore updates that have been coming out after the release of Silas are just mostly maintenance. It's just like, let's just check in what's going on with the characters in the world and how are they doing and what are they thinking and stuff like that. And so it's not very interesting on its own. It's interesting as a part of the story that's being set up in Asher War Mother and the broader narrative of the Freljord and stuff like that. But on its own, it's, it's kind of inconsequential. Essentially, it just shows a day in the life of Ash, specifically a harvest feast where she shows off the power of the bow and she has this dark moment of, oh, are they following me or are they only following the magic bow that I use? And if I don't have the bow, am I really a leader at all? That kind of self-doubt moment. And then there is a moment of showing Ash's character as a leader, where some people, a, a tribe who had murdered some of her tribe's folk before, have come to the feast, and Ash is like, 
I really want to freaking kill you because you murdered some of my people, you bastard. But then the tribal leader of that enemy tribe goes down on one knee and says, Hey, yo, you know, we thought you were like a false prophet, but it turns out we were super wrong and you're actually a real prophet. So you can kill me, but just like let my tribe join your tribe because we want to be part of the thing you've got going on here. And that's when you have that moment where Ash is like, I really freaking want to kill you. But she has to make the de the benevolent decision, the, the strategic decision and the ideological decision to let the enemy tribal leader live instead. And that's sort of that's sort of the character moment that's being displayed in this particular story. This moment of, no, I shall not choose vengeance for vengeance is the wrong way to lead to the Freljord. That moment of sort of noble sacrifice of what she personally wants in favor of what is necessary for the survival of the project. Which seemed to me to be establishing the dynamic that's going to be prevalent between Ash and Sichuani now that they've set them up as childhood friends. That Ash is someone who will avoid bloodshed even when that bloodshed might be culturally justified in, in the culture that she lives in. Where Sichuani is someone who would be like, no, you have to take revenge because that's the thing you have to do in order to show that you're strong. And if you don't do it, then you're weak and you are vulnerable. Uh, that at least is my speculation. Okay, so that's most of the video is going to be about Ash, apparently, but we will speak briefly now about Trindamir. His lore update is much less substantial than Ash's lore update is. Again, it's mostly a maintenance thing to kind of bring him into line where, where he needs with where he needs to be in order to make sense as a modern part of the modern Freljord. The trouble with Trindamir is that he hasn't had a lore update of any kind since 2013. And that lore update was, I believe, timed to coincide with the original release of Aatrox. And that was back in the day when there was supposed to be some kind of deep lore connection between Aatrox and Trindamir, where like, oh, maybe Aatrox was responsible for Trindamir getting his rage powers or whatever. That <clears throat> was set up, but then in typical Riot fashion was never expanded upon in any meaningful way. And then the Aatrox rework happened and most of what Trindamir used to be kind of got thrown into question. So now we have a lore update that's kind of meant to square the circle of who Trindamir is and what he wants in the modern state of the game. Now, Aatrox is still present in this version of the lore, and it plays out exactly the same as Trindamir's old lore. Essentially, Aatrox shows up to Trindamir's tribe, murders everybody, Trindamir gets mad, Aatrox leaves mysteriously, for some reason leaving Trindamir alive, and there's some kind of intrigue going on there. Now, I can only assume that the idea in the modern lore is that Aatrox wants Trindamir as a vessel for his sword, and the thing he's doing is like he's trying to toughen Trindamir up or make him stronger somehow so that Aatrox can have a really strong, durable vessel for himself when he needs one. The trouble with that, though, is that the modern conception of Aatrox since his rework is that he's not really the long-term manipulator hiding behind the scenes for dozens of years, watching all his, you know, carefully laid plans played out, that he's more, he's a desperate prisoner who's just trying to escape from the confinement of his sword by any means necessary. Like, that's the whole point of his short story, is that it's this horrifying, confining, existentially destructive place where he will escape from by any means necessary, and he doesn't really care about the long term, he just cares about not suffering right now, not being trapped right now. And so reconciling those two is, uh, I don't really know where they're going with this, and I'm not sure I like that they kept that detail around just because that was part of, you know, the original conception of Aatrox, that he had this connection to Trindamir, which they never expanded on, so I don't think it's much of a sacrifice to just kind of throw it away and go, oh well, that didn't work, and let's just let Aatrox be his own character without having a connection to Trindamir. Especially since Aatrox is supposed now to be a Shuriman champion, to be connected to that area of the world, which is the opposite side of the planet from the Freljord. So what the hell is he doing all the way up there? Anyway, this is not supposed to be about Aatrox. This is supposed to be about Trindamir. And so, um... The consequence of Trindamir's encounter with Aatrox is that he's possessed by a rage unlike anything he had ever experienced. And, like, he becomes really sort of extremely super angry, and that anger uh, gives him an unnatural vitality. It makes it harder for him to die and makes him more powerful in combat. And so he's the only one left of his tribe who can lead. And then there's like a few bedraggled survivors as well. And so rather than seeking vengeance immediately, Trindamir has to find some way to provide for his people. So he goes to the Averosans and having absolutely nothing else to recommend him, he starts challenging everybody to duels and starts challenging them to fights. And Ash takes notice of this because she needs to take some kind of a husband. That's kind of, that's the expected social behavior when you're the warm mother of a tribe. You take some kind of political marriage with some member of another tribe in order to build bonds. 
but she can't really take a member of any of the major tribes in her coalition because that would just create tension with the ones that she didn't choose. And she can't take multiple husbands because then they'll just start killing each other in order to get closer to power. So she needs a third option. And Trindamir presents a third option. He's an incredibly powerful warrior who's almost impossible to kill, which means that anyone who challenges him for her hand will probably be swiftly beaten. And he's also a powerful enough warrior that he'll be useful in consolidating Ash's political power at the head of the coalition. And so, a political marriage between the two is reached. For Trindamir's part, while he finds a certain level of peace in being in a, in a peaceful position with his tribe, and he's got this lovely, powerful wife who's helping him out and stuff like that, he's also still haunted by that anger and rage and that lust for revenge, and so he finds himself wondering whether his place is really with the Avarosans or whether he has some kind of other mission that he should be embarking upon. And here, they seem to be foreshadowing a little bit that maybe Trindamir at some point is going to be like, no, I need to go and I seriously need to go and murder Aatrox because screw that guy, which... Yeah, I guess, but it's 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 sort of a ticking clock that's being introduced into the story that Trindamir is like he's okay with things as they are right now, but someday like a thing might snap or go too far and eventually he'll decide to go on some kind of life-changing epic journey with a great story that's going to be happening. And that again, because I don't see that happening within like the next few years of League of Legends with the pace of lore that's been coming out right now, and because I'm not sure Riot would be willing to make that substantial uh, change to the Freljord anytime soon, it's sort of an empty teaser. Like, it's an empty teaser for something that I don't have any confidence will be happening anytime soon. Of course I could be wrong. Like, Riot have been proving me wrong multiple times recently about how much lore content they're willing and able to put out, which I'm very happy about, but for the moment... A teaser like that doesn't really seem to contain much, especially since there really isn't a dynamic between Trindamir and Aatrox. They haven't had any real... Like, their encounter was Aatrox showed up, beat Trindamir unconscious, and then he's, he just f***ed off. And now Trindamir's like, well, I'm gonna get that guy who f***ed off, who I, don't, I didn't even really get to see properly. Like, that's not much of a dynamic to build a ticking clock on. It's not really that he's haunted by the face of this warrior who defeated him in combat with whom he has this long and bitter history. It was just some guy who showed up, killed everyone, and then left. And Trindamir's like, yeah, my life's mission is gonna be to get that guy, which is like, it's kind of weak compared to the much, what I would find much more interesting, which would be serious explorations of what does it mean for someone like Trindamir, whose language is so mired in violence, to be married to a peacemaker and to sort of trying to find himself inside the Avarosian coalition, and what kind of influence does Trindamir have on the Avarosian coalition? And oh, here's another interesting question. What's Trindamir's dynamic with Sejuani like? A warrior who's much more like him in a lot of ways, who's a childhood friend of Ash and who's also a powerful political leader, and could there be a temptation there to maybe switch allegiances? Like, that kind of stuff would be lot, much more interesting to me than Trindamir having some kind of rage vision quest to kill Aatrox or whatever it is they're setting up. But yeah, in a final analysis, this is a little bit of maintenance that is long overdue, both for Ash, who was required some kind of update to bring her into line with Modern League for a long time, and which the War Mother comic seems to now finally have incentivized, and for Trindamir, who has always been just way too underdeveloped of a character for how important he really is to League of Legends in a lot of ways. Like, he is Mark Merrill's personal avatar in the game. It's a little weird that he's been neglected for so long, but they have both now been brought into what I would consider a workable state for the foreseeable future. Like, this is a state where you can start telling stories from where they are, without having to, you know, jump through a lot of hoops. Like, it's all, it's in a nice neutral state, and from here you can build some interesting stories out, which I very much hope that Riot are actually going to do. Hey, thank you very much for watching. I have been talking fast for a lot of this video because there was a lot to say and I didn't want this damn video to be over 45 minutes long. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, there's a like button down below. You can also hit the subscribe button in order to see more videos kind of like this one and videos that are also not at all like this one. I have started streaming every Saturday at 8 p.m. Central European Standard Time, which is like 1 p.m. Eastern Time, I think, something like that. Yeah, probably. Uh, I'm going to be streaming God of War, the 2018 PS4 game for the next few times, but we're also going to be streaming other stuff and interacting with the chat and having fun. So if you want to do that, I'm going to schedule it on the YouTube channel. You can follow the YouTube channel. You can come hang out and do stuff if you want to. If you don't want to do that, of course, it's completely okay. Just subscribe for videos instead of streams then. Now, if you want to help support the channel and help me pay for rent and food and 
pants, which I really have been fixated on buying new pants recently, because, like, the ones I've got, they've got this big hole that's forming the cr Anyway, you don't want to hear about that. If you want to do that, then there's Patreon available for that. You can get some rewards over there, including some exclusive roles on my Discord server. Various stuff, you can go and look at it. If you don't want to do the recurring donation thing, of course, that's completely okay. I also have a coffee link, um, which is the thing where you can donate like $3 at a time, because if you only donate $1, PayPal pretty much takes all of it. So $3 at a time, if you want to tip me uh, for the work that I do, I'd, I'd be very grateful. If you're not able to do any of that, or not willing to do any of that, of course, that's completely okay. I'm just happy that you've watched the video this far. Now, if you haven't enjoyed this video, well, right now you may be despairing, thinking that there's no possible way for you to express that discontent, to express how much you did not like this video, despite the fact that you've watched it through almost until the very end. Well, I come to you now with a story of hope. As you know, in the ancient times, before history began, before songs were sung, before the tides of time had crashed on the shores of the universe, three great powers united to form the world we know today. The like, the comment, and subscribe. By their powers combined, they formed the mighty algorithm, and from the algorithm sprung the universe of YouTube that we know today. But I'm here to tell you that you haven't heard the whole story. For there was a fourth power behind that magnificent creation. Its existence has been hidden for thousands of years, destroyed by a cabal of international conspirators intent on keeping the truth from you, but there is a fourth power on YouTube. They call it the dislike button. And if you believe, if you truly believe in your heart that there is another way, if you hold your faith in the dislike button in your heart like a flame, then gaze you now below this video. And if you are a true believer, then there you shall see its mighty signal, signifying that you, by divine providence, has been given the power to express your dislike of a video on YouTube. Thank you very much for watching.